morning. Welcome to St. John's. This is the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome this day. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, and blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from 1 Kings. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and not have asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 119, 
Let us read responsively by whole verse. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. When your word is forth to give life, it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant. I long for your commandments. Turn to me in mercy, as you always do to those who love your name. Steady my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Let your countenance shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed tears, because people do not keep your law. Here ends the psalm. Our second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he, al he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are all being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. 
Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it, is, so, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Once upon a time, a strange old man came into a small village. He carried a mixing bowl and a wooden spoon. This sight was odd enough to cause the people of the village to notice what the old man did next. The old man took the bowl to the plowed field next to the village, and he put some dirt into the bowl until it was about half full. Then he went to the village pump and filled it with water to about an inch below the brim. Then the old man sat down on a rock next to the pump and began to stir the water into the dirt and he stirred it with a wooden spoon. He stirred and he stirred and he stirred. The people watched this without much interest until the old man became visibly excited. He peered happily into the bowl and then reached in and pulled out a mud-covered pebble. He then went to the pump and washed it off and held it up to the sun to inspect it. The people came closer, and they could see that it was a gold nugget. The old man then went back to stirring. He stirred and stirred for a long time, and then again he became excited, pulled something out of the bowl, washed it off, and held another gold nugget in his hand. This went on for a long time, the old man stirring and stirring and every once in a while, excitingly receive, retrieving gold nuggets from the bowl. Finally, when he had a half dozen nuggets or so, he lined, lined them up next to him. The old man stopped stirring, washed out the bowl at the pump, picked up the nuggets, and then went on his way. As you can imagine, no sooner had the strange old man disappeared over the horizon than the people of the village seized their bowls and their spoons, scooped some dirt into the bowls, filled them with water, and began to stir. They stirred and they stirred. Even though they stirred and stirred for hours and looked and looked and occasionally ran their fingers through the mud of the bowl, no gold nuggets appeared. Many of them got tired of this. 
The rich put down their bowls because they already had enough gold. The children put down their bowls because playing was more important to them than gold nuggets. The young men and women put down their bowls because love was much more important to them than gold nuggets. The poor kept on stirring the longest, but most of them finally gave up, deciding that there were better ways to feed themselves and their families. At last, only one poor woman was left. She kept stirring until it became too dark to see, and then she resumed the task the next morning and stirred all day with no results. But she kept stirring. Finally, as evening was falling again, the poor woman saw the strange old man returning. The old man came to the spot where the poor woman was stirring and stirring the mud in the bowl and asked what she was doing. The poor woman explained that she had seen the old man stir, stir the mud the day before and pull out gold nuggets. She wondered why she couldn't do the same. The old man inspected the bowl, asked about the dirt and the water, scratched his head in puzzlement. It's all the, all the same, he said. I don't know why it isn't working. After a few moments more, the old man thought and said, Oh, yes, there's one more thing. When you're stirring the mud, you can't be thinking about gold nuggets. To stir mud without thinking about gold nuggets is a paradox. Like finding treasure in a field. The dictionary says that a paradox is a statement that seems to be con con contrary and contradictory to common sense. It may be true. The parables in this passage are filled with paradoxes as well, though. On the one hand, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, something we must find and something we must willing, be willing to give everything for. On the other hand, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for a rare pearl. In other words, the kingdom of heaven comes looking for us, and gives everything for our sake. On the one hand, said Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that catches every kind of fish in the sea. The kingdom of heaven has the original policy of non-discrimination. On the other hand, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven will be like the angels sorting the fish. The good ones will be kept and the bad ones will be thrown away. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is highly discriminating, a very exclusive realm. Do you understand, Jesus asks his disciples, and they say they do. Jesus says that his disciples must be professors of paradox. He uses the word scribe. The scribes were the professors, the learned people, the teachers, and the interpreters of the Word of God. Professors of paradox can handle contradictions. They're able to see the value in both the old and the new. They can stir the mud and not think of gold nuggets. We have to be professors of paradox in order to grasp what Jesus is saying about the kingdom of heaven in these parables. The first thing that Jesus says about the kingdom is that it is something we must find. Yet we discovered it, discovered it accidentally. The poet Robert Frost once wrote to his friend Sidney Cox, Our minds are so crowded with what we have been told to look for that we have no room for accidental discoveries. Most of the things really worth finding in life are accidental, accidental discoveries. Think about the way most people meet their future spouses. I know a young woman who turned around during the passing of the peace at her church and shook hands with a man sitting directly behind her. 
And they were married 18 months later. There's another story. A groom asked a friend to be his best man at his wedding, and the best man spent the entire wedding reception with the maid of honor, and in a year they were married. Thirty years later, the first groom lost his wife, and two years later, the maid of honor lost her husband. The widower sent the new widow a note of condolence. The widow wrote back her heartfelt thanks. They got together to share some memories, and that was it. That started the healing. Tears of grief gradually became tears of laughter, and life began again for both of them, surprisingly and unexpectedly. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Do you understand, Jesus asked his disciples, can we say yes along with the disciples? Do we understand that the best things in life, the things we would give our very lives for, are discovered mostly by accident? I mean, it's an accident, and it isn't an accident. The people who accidentally stumble upon someone they want to share their lives with, whether that person is a stranger or someone they've known all their lives, usually are people who are consciously or unconsciously looking for someone special. The the strange thing is that people who are not looking too hard or who are too desperate or who have too clear an idea of exactly what they're looking for are the least likely to find their treasure. Their neediness can drive others away. Or they may latch onto the first person who comes along, even though that person is entirely unsuited for them. Or they may overlook the right person because he or she doesn't fit their preconceived notions of what their future spouse should be like. Those who do find, the ones who stumble or seem to stumble on the real treasures are often the ones who say, well, I had just decided that it probably wasn't going to happen to me anyway. Or that was the last place I expected to meet anyone. Or the last thing that surprised me the most was that she isn't my type at all. The scribes of the kingdom have to be professors of paradox. People who can stir the bowl of mud but not think of finding gold nuggets. The nugget that the ordinary scribes were looking for was a, some, was a Messiah who looked like a king. The nugget a lot of people who came to Jesus were looking for was physical health. He gave it to them, but it wasn't the kingdom. Other people were looking for the gold nugget of peace of mind, and Jesus drove out their demons. But that wasn't the treasure of the kingdom either. Others thought the gold nugget was acceptance and closeness to someone else. And Jesus gave them his friendship and welcomed them into his fellowship, and they were closer to the kingdom. But that wasn't the kingdom either. What is the kingdom, this treasure? Jesus never really says what it is exactly. We might translate the phrase as the government of God or the reign of God. Jesus sometimes calls it eternal life or abundant life too. Jesus never says exactly what it is, but he does tell us it is like a treasure hidden in a field. That part of the world where Jesus lived and is, was and is a land swept by wars and invasions. Every time people heard that invaders were coming, they'd bury their valuables in spots that only they knew about. Where the, when the threat, threat passed, they dug them up again. Sometimes the invaders carried away the owner and the treasures stayed buried. Forgotten, generations may have come and gone, plowing the fields over the top of the treasure. For the treasure 
to be found again, two things had to happen. Frost and earth tremors had to push the treasure upward toward the surface, and someone had to come along who was looking for treasure, but not looking for anything in particular. It had to be someone whose head was not so filled of what he had been taught to look for that he could not discover anything accidentally. In other words, it had to be a professor of paradox, someone hungry enough, poor enough, desperate enough to keep stirring the mud in the bowl yet without thinking about those gold nuggets. People who find the treasure are not the ones who grow tired of looking and lose interest, nor the ones who are already satisfied with life, nor those who are so discouraged that they give up. Do you understand this? Of course you do. When we are hungry, we see signs for food everywhere. I know I do. When we're lonely, We look into our mailbox, and if there's a personal letter there, we will see it even under all the junk mail and bills. We didn't expect a letter, really, but we saw it when it came. When we are poor, it's amazing how we can spot a nickel on the sidewalk and a bargain in the store window. When we are grieving, our ears seem to pick up comforting words, and our eyes seem to fall upon comforting pictures even though we couldn't imagine that anything could bring us comfort at the time. Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Our search for the kingdom is prompted by a hunger that is deeper than our hunger for food and a loneliness that other people cannot fill. Our search is prompted by the grief we feel about our own deaths and a poverty that cannot be measured by the balance of our bank accounts. We only have to be careful to keep our minds open to those accidental discoveries. If our minds are full of things we've been taught to look for, like a particular kind of religious experience, or a particular kind of religious community, or a particular kind of emotional or psychological or physical care, we're not going to find the kingdom. We find the kingdom by being hungry and by being open to whatever will fill that hunger. It's also necessary for the treasure to come to the surface so that the seeker may find. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven comes looking for us like a merchant looking for pearls or like a shepherd looking for the lost sheep. One of the things we find when we accidentally stumble on the kingdom is that the kingdom has been looking for us all along. The king has been looking for us. That's the way of expressing what the treasure is. It's the discovery of that we are treasured, that we are the treasure. A psychologist by the name of Carol Pearson recently said that psychologists have a term for that rare disorder which they call delusions of grandeur. But they have no term for the disorder common to nearly all of us the delusion of insignificance and worthlessness. The treasure of the kingdom gives us a sense of worth that no job, no title, no human love, no skill or accomplishment could ever give us. I see that often in people who have newly discovered the kingdom. They often talk as if the entire universe were set up for their own convenience and encouragement and education. They become in some way or another like narcissists. God helped me find this job. 
God must have told you to send me that send me that letter. It was just what I needed at exactly the right moment. Exactly what I needed. God gave me cancer to teach me to be more compassionate. I'm really sometimes and generally turned off by that kind of talk. I believe it's more complicated than that. I do not believe that God does anything like that. I believe that God gives us, notice I said us, opportunities for us to find what and where the treasure is. Many of us believe the treasure has always been there, but it's up to us to discover it. We believe that everything works for good for those who love God and are called according to God's purposes. Many times the opportunity presents itself for us to run with it, to be plowing in that field the day the treasure rose to the surface. Perhaps a person was at a place where they were presented with the opportunity to meet the person they would marry. I cannot in my heart believe that God would intentionally go through the physical and mental pain of cancer or any other disease that would eventually lead them to hunger to go looking for the kingdom, to ask, seek, and knock until the door is open. No. We are chosen as God's children from the beginning of the world to hear a particular sermon, to read a particular book, or meet a person, or think a thought, or whatever it is that causes the light to shine off the gold, the diamond, the pearl, that let them know that they are God's treasure. That they are treasured so much that God's Son, Jesus himself, would give everything for them, even his very life. Do you understand this? Do you understand this? Do you understand that we really don't find God's kingdom so much as it finds us? Do you understand that we really can't give any treasure made on earth to enter this kingdom because our way has been paved with the blood of Christ? Do you understand that the treasure you seek, that we seek, is the life of Christ incarnate, the love that resides in each one of us? That's the pearl. That's the treasure. The love that God has for us. Amen. Let us stand and say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For our President Donald, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We ask that you keep in your prayers this morning Larry Arnold, Louis Bartlett, Barbara Bean, Sam Butterworth, Elisa Carraway, Bruce Case, Eddie Cummings, James and Iantha Daniels, Calvin and Gladys Harris, Carol and Ed Hickey, Nadine Kukinski, Gloria Lee, George Mahaney, Kathy Mall, Scott Mall, Charles Minor, Mary Parlair, Phyllis Porcher, Jocelyn Powell, Bob Seaver, Elizabeth Allison and Sarah Westbank. And we pray for all the people in the world facing strife and war. We pray for all who are deployed around the world. We pray for the Hopewell Prince George Chesterfield Fire, EMS, and law enforcement departments. We pray for those whose lives are on the front line serving the needs of all people during this COVID pandemic. And we pray especially for those persons and their families who are dealing with the virus firsthand. We pray for all who are facing uncertainty. God, for the present, God of the present moment, God who in Jesus stills the storm and soothes the frantic heart. Bring hope and courage to all who wait or work in uncertainty. Bring hope that you will make them the equal of whatever lies ahead. Bring them courage to endure what cannot be avoided, for your will is health and wholeness. You are God and we need you. Amen. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We also give thanks for the flowers on the altar today, given by Chuck and Karen Fredrickson, to the glory of God and in memory of Pat Fredrickson. We pray for those who celebrate the anniversaries of their birth this week, including George Elder, Katie Gunnan, Harvey Lang, Melissa Molesky, and David Walker. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom especially Ray Harold. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, us most, most merciful Father. Father. In, in your, your compassion, compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, unknown things, things done and left undone. undone. And, and so, so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God's peace, peace brother. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace. Welcome this day to St. John's, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Um, we want to give a big thank you to our soloist this morning, Courtney. Um, Courtney will be heading off to college pretty soon. Pretty soon. How many days coming up? What? About a week? Three weeks coming up. Okay, well, you have a little bit of time, but not a whole lot. But we sure thank you for coming today to do our music and, and solo today. Um, we have been on um, the Facebook page now for almost 18, 19 weeks. 
And coming up soon, um, I, I th think it's around uh, August, we will be changing some formats on this, and so keep your head up, um, and we will be putting it out on our website. I'll be trying to explain it to you uh, when it comes up. I'm not sure how well explaining I can do, but um, they, will, they will continue to be live streamed on Facebook, um, on my page, and that's where some of the issues have come in, um, is that it's really hard to get you know, uh, an entity page or an institution page without somebody else, you know, putting it up and having to put your name in it, and then it becomes your page too. Um, but we do have a St. John's page, and um, so we can, we'll continue posting um, on there as well as um, the church website. Uh, you can go and pick them up there. Um, uh, after the service, but uh, we, as we will continue, we're going to um, uh, live stream on Facebook, Facebook through August, and we will be reformatting um, after that, starting Labor Day weekend, I think that's separate, sec, uh, September 6th, I think, uh, may be wrong, but kind of uh, keep around that date, it's, anyway, it's Labor Day weekend, um, and as we hopefully regather together, um, though uncertain at the moment, I'm hoping that it will be around that same date. Um, so the, stay tuned for where it will be, um, uh, will be going to a YouTube channel. And uh, it, might, it probably will be a little bit easier for you to get to. And um, anyway, we'll continue doing what we're doing for a little while anyway. Don't forget about vacation, virtual, virtual uh, vacation Bible school. So it's VVBS. <laughs> virtual uh, vacation Bible school. Um, it's, it's, it started last week, but it continues through August the 2nd. Um, there's a quarantine-friendly uh, curriculum out there, um, and so there's some videos, instructions to follow, and uh, if you <clears throat> need to get to it or have questions about it, please uh, email Becky Redling at R-R-E-D-B-E-C-C-A -R -R -E -R -R -E -E at gmail.com. It's Redbecca. Rebecca, okay, at gmail.com. And that'll get you all set if you, um, you can go to, um, um, in, on to Google and look for Bolt. Um, it's, the vibe, it's the curriculum that we're talking about. So thank you, Becky, for all that you've done to put all this together and to keep our young folks um, in a uh, Bible school mode. We appreciate that. We also have uh, the new Forward Day by Day that has come in, uh, the August, September, October 2020 Forward Day by Days, the booklets, uh, including large print. Um, you can pick one up at the church during our regular business hours, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 1230, and um, we'd love to see it that as well. Uh, there are still a few, few slots on the, on the flower chart. Um, you can give a call and, and find out where they are and, um, um, or call me on my cell phone and I'll look it up for you. Um, so thank you very much for all of you who have um, given flowers in memories of others and in honor of others and um, hope that you'll keep doing that um, as we go along. So, Courtney, you ready? <laughs> All right. And, and you're going to be going to Longwood, is that yes. right? Yes. Longwood. Terrific. Anyway, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Shed no tears for me, there'll be rain enough 
today. I'm wishing you Godspeed as I wave you on your way. This won't be the first time I've stayed behind to face the bitter consequences of an ancient fall from grace. I'm a daughter The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth uniting peoples of many tongues in the fashion of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, 
In your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us say together, my Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as I proclaim your resurrection. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank, thank you, you for feeding us with, with the spiritual food, food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you this day and always. Amen. Amen.